Okay, folks, <clears throat> let's get started. So let's see a couple of things. Uh, number one, review session here tomorrow night at 5 o'clock after the lecture is over. And uh, yes, I will videotape that. And yes, I will try to get it posted as quickly as I can. Uh, second, for those of you who have submitted exam corrections, I have not um, had a chance to look at those yet. I will try to do that tonight and have those back in the main office tomorrow sometime. And uh, third, the exam is on Friday. So time flies when you're having fun, right? Okay, so uh, today I'm going to finish up talking about uh, the metabolism of um, glucose and to talk a little bit about regulation, which I haven't talked about yet, and then move our attention to uh, talking about the, the, the storage or the synthesis of glucose. And uh, we'll see how that goes. I haven't decided yet exactly where I'm going to cut off the material for the uh, exam on Friday. It will likely go through tomorrow. That's my plan at the moment, but I need to see kind of how far I get in the various things that I'm doing. But I'll let you know that, obviously. Okay, so last time I talked, when I finished talking, I was talking about what happens to pyruvate. And uh, if you look at pyruvate's fates, I showed this figure. And uh, just to briefly remind you, there are three different directions that pyruvate can go. It depends on the organism and it depends on the conditions. So all aerobic organisms, when they have oxygen, will go through the middle route. And that's because when there's plenty of oxygen, then um, there's plenty of NAD. We'll see later why that's the case. But remember that the, if, if cells don't have enough NAD, they run, out, they run into problems with respect to glycolysis. And so when they don't have this option available to them, they have to th start thinking about recycling their NADH to make NAD. And that's why these two processes come into uh, consideration at that time. Okay? In animals, they go through the process on the left. And the process on the left involves um, conversion of pyruvate into lactate. That conversion of pyruvate into lactate uh, generates NAD. And that NAD is used to keep glycolysis going. This is a fermentation. Whenever we're doing anaerobic mechanisms of glucose metabolism, we're talking about fermentation. In bacteria and yeast, on the other hand, when they run out of oxygen, they do the process as shown over here on the right. And uh, in them, they are converting pyruvate. Ultimately, there's actually a two-step reaction. But they're ultimately converting pyruvate into ethanol. I have a little bit more to say about this in a, in a few minutes. And they're also regenerating NAD, and that NAD is used to keep glycolysis going. So um, that's the sort of things that happens with pyruvate metabolism. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm going to do now is talk just briefly about this alcoholic fermentation. Then I'm going to go back and finish up talking about regulation, and then we'll be done with this section. I know I've kind of jumped around a little bit, but your book is a little higgledy-piggledy in how it talks about things. All right. Well, first of all, pyruvate to lactate. You don't need to know structures, but you can see here what's happening. Pyruvate is getting converted to lactate. This ketone group right here is becoming um, um, uh, hydrogenated, and uh, electrons are added to make this alcohol group known as lactate. Those electrons come from NADH, as you can see here, uh, producing this guy. And there's their product of NAD that the cell is trying to make. Lactate is also known, of course, as lactic acid. And lactic acid is something that can accumulate in our muscles. Uh, some people think that that is why our muscles get sore if we overly exert ourselves. Uh, other people argue with that, so it's not a, uh, a given. But that one thinking, one line of thinking is that uh, lactic acid contributes to muscle soreness. Now, um, what's I think a little bit more interesting is looking at what happens in bacteria. So bacteria, you recall, when they run out of oxygen, bacteria and yeast both, they uh, ultimately make ethanol. And they make ethanol in a two-step process. The first step involves a decarboxylation of pyruvate. And again, I'm showing you structures. You're not responsible for structures uh, here. And this is catalyzed by um, an, an enzyme that we'll talk a little bit more about later called pyruvate decarboxylase. Now, this reaction by itself isn't of that much significance. Um, but what is significant is this guy here that's made, acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde, you'll notice there's been no oxidation that's happened in this process. There's no NADH showing on the screen. In the second step of bacterial and yeast fermentation, this acetaldehyde becomes converted to ethanol. That takes electrons from NADH, 
and makes ethanol plus NAD. <coughs> Excuse me. The enzyme that catalyzes that is called alcohol dehydrogenase. I think that's an enzyme that's worth knowing. So the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase converts acetaldehyde into ethanol. Okay. Now, there's a problem with it. Not a problem, but it's, it's a kind of a curious thing. We have in our bodies alcohol dehydrogenase. We have an abundance of alcohol dehydrogenase primarily in our liver. Why can't we make ethanol? Well, you're not going to know the answer to that question. I'll tell you the answer to that question. And the answer is because we do not make acetaldehyde as an intermediate. When we decarboxylate pyruvate, we make acetyl-CoA, as we'll see later. And there's no chance to make acetaldehyde. So the question is, well, if we don't make acetaldehyde, why do we have alcohol dehydrogenase? The reason we have alcohol dehydrogenase is to detoxify alcohol. The reaction it catalyzes in us is the backwards reaction that happens in bacteria and yeast. That is, there, we're, we are converting ethanol into acetaldehyde. If you want to know why you have a hangover, blame alcohol dehydrogenase, because acetaldehyde is what gives you your hangover. Now, ethanol in high concentrations is toxic in the body. You can die of ethanol poisoning. So you actually have alcohol dehydrogenase to keep you from poisoning yourself. But the downside is, is that you make acetaldehyde, which makes you sick. Does that make sense? Stuart? So I'm not sure I understand the question. I'll call it the hydrogenase, uh huh? Concentrate alcohol. I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> you want to know where the acid aldehyde goes to? Okay, so it's a good question. Um, from a chemistry point of view, if I asked you what happens to acetaldehyde, what would you tell me? What do you know about aldehydes? They're very reactive, right? What's going to happen to that aldehyde? It's probably going to make acetic acid, which may contribute to the uh, hangover. But more commonly, it's going to be acetic acid, as we will see, can be linked to um, coenzyme A to make acetyl-CoA. So it's actually a way of dealing with that ethanol uh, and giving us the cell something that would be useful to it ultimately. Does that answer your question, Stuart? OK. All right. So that's what happens. That's why we have alcohol dehydrogenase, not for making ethanol, but for detoxifying it, basically. Um, Enzyme, uh, uh, coenzymes that are involved in this process, um, they're actually found in the um, pyruvate decarboxylase, uh, is thiamine, thiamine and thiamine pyrophosphate, specifically this guy down here. Thiamine is vitamin B1, and we convert it into thiamine pyrophosphate by putting two phosphate groups onto it. This is necessary for decarboxylating um, pyruvate. We have this in our body, we need this in our body because we are also decarboxylating pyruvate, but we're not making acetaldehyde, as I said. We're making acetyl-CoA. Uh, OK. Now, that's the last thing I want to say there. And now what I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about regulation. This is the first time during the term I've talked about regulation, so um, I need to introduce this topic just a little bit. Regulation is important for cells. When I say regulation, what do I mean? Basically, what I mean is control of enzymatic reactions. Control of enzymatic reactions. Why do we need to control enzymatic reactions? Well, I talked earlier about ATCase. And if you recall, I said ATCase was acting as a feed, was an enzyme that was feedback inhibited. Why was it important that it was feedback inhibited?
doesn't want to make any more. So it wants to shut down the whole pathway. So cells are efficient. They tend to want to shut off entire pathways. Glycolysis is a very unusual pathway in that there are three different places where this pathway gets shut down, not just one. The aim is the same, shutting down the pathway. You might wonder, well, why three different places? Why not start it at the first step? And the answer to that question is that there are intermediates that are useful in the pathway for other processes. So depending upon where we stop the pathway, some of these intermediates could be used for other things. Now, there are three places where the pathway is regulated, and you should definitely know these enzymes. The first one is hexokinase. This was an enzyme that catalyzed a reaction that you may recall had a fairly negative delta G zero prime value. I will not talk about the mechanism by which this enzyme does it. It's a little confusing to understand. But suffice it to say that hexokinase does, in fact, help to regulate glycolysis. Okay. Secondly, um, the enzyme PFK, phosphofructokinase, this is the one that catalyzes F6P to F16BP. Phosphofructokinase is probably the most interesting of these enzymes. It's regulated in um, a couple of ways. Okay? First of all, it's inhibited by ATP. That's an allosteric inhibition. And from the perspective of the pathway, this makes very good sense, right? It makes very good sense because what's ATP an indicator of? High energy or low energy? High energy. So if we have high energy, do we want to be burning more sugar to make more energy? No. So this high energy indicator is telling the cell, we don't need any more ATP. Let's stop glycolysis. Let's not burn our gasoline uh, with our, our idling engine. Let's turn the engine off. Okay, so we don't waste resources. We'll need these resources later. Okay. This enzyme is turned on by something else that's interesting. It's turned on by AMP. AMP is related to ATP. It only has a single phosphate. When cells have lots of AMP, they're in a very low energy state. They're needing energy. So this is AMP is now telling the cell, hey, you better get this thing going for me or we're going to be in trouble. Okay. Now we'll talk later um, about another molecule that regulates PFK, but we need to talk about it when I talk about gluconeogenesis. So just keep in your mind that there's one other molecule, a very important molecule, that helps to regulate PFK. Okay. Now the last one is a very surprising one. A surprising one is the very last enzyme in the pathway is regulated. This is pyruvate kinase. By the way, PFK catalyzed a reaction that had a large negative delta G zero prime value. Pyruvate kinase also has a large negative delta, uh, delta G zero prime value. So we see the three enzymes that I've described to you as having large negative delta G zero prime values, all are allosterically regulated. That actually gives a clue to why this one is regulated. All right. This guy, if you recall, catalyzed the reaction I described as the Big Bang. And this was the one I said generated a lot of heat. Okay. What that means is that this reaction is very, very favored in the forward direction. Why does that matter? Well, let's imagine that I'm a cell and I've got plenty of energy. And I want to start making glucose. Cells do that. When they've got a lot of energy, they're going to store it, that energy in the form of glucose. What are they going to do? Well, we'll see.